thanks very much for inviting me. This is a fantastic um, event to be attending. When Sophie invited me, there was no, there was no other response but yes, please. <laughs> um, I've done research um, on cocoa for many years, since, since the early 2000s. And, and I think um, a key thing that I was always told, um, I have a very long interest in gender and agri-food value chains. But I was always told cocoa is a male crop. Why are you interested in gender issues? And this came from multiple different sources. Now, the only outlier on that was a small organization you might have heard of called Quapa Coco, where from very early on, there was a really strong gender focus. So it was clear that some sections, if you like, of the Ghanaian cocoa sector were, were, were focused in on gender issues. But this has now begun to change. And really what they should have said or what people should have been saying to me is cocoa farm or recognized cocoa farm owners are male. Not that cocoa is a male crop. And there's a big distinction between the two. So this idea has really been challenged, and I think it's been challenged for three, just very briefly, three sources, one of which you'll hear more about. Increasing concern over many, many years by companies about the future sustainability of cocoa production, particularly in West Africa. And just in terms of my own involvement, um, I had been doing research in cocoa from around 2003, something like that, um, but Cadbury, were one of the companies early on before the Amajara prediction who were becoming worried about future sustainability and commissioned research, which I led. So um, in, in Ghana with um, uh, Kojo Asansi Ochiero, who's, um, Ochieri, who unfortunately has passed away, so I very much dedicate this work to him as well. Um, but in increasingly the recognition that there were challenges to cocoa farming and what the research, my own research and many other uh, in, as well, began to show is that women actually play a critical role in cocoa production and at key stages, and I'll come back to that in a second. So you had a kind of underlying groundswell. Um, the Amajaro prediction of a one million tonne shortage by 2020 shook the industry, in my view. I don't completely concur with it because I don't think they've taken into account the role women play. But anyway, that's a separate discussion. So you had this groundswell building up. The Oxfam Behind the Bands campaign, which you'll hear more about in a minute, really shone a light onto the gender issues. And I think that was the sort of final clinch that really fired the industry up as to um, the role of, of women in production. So just very briefly, if we think of the whole value chain, women are key at the consumer end. Um, women are responsible for about 70 to 80 percent of all, uh, across the board, of all sales, retail sales in supermarkets, etc. And they are particularly, um, as consumers, uh, keen on, on um, uh, the higher quality, uh, mid to higher quality type of chocolate. And also, more women will pay extra for fair trade than men, I and mean, there's research to show that. Coming through the value chain, I'll leave that for a second, at the cocoa production end, what the research really showed, and I think this was a wake-up call certainly for Cadbury and the other sections of the industry are slowly waking up, it's not just simply that women are involved in production. Where their roles are particularly concentrated are early crop, are early crop care with the seedlings, um, and then in post-harvest, fermentation and drying. When I'm not an agronomist, but when I talked to agronomists and asked what are the key dimensions needed to increase yields and increase quality, early crop care, post-harvest, fermentation and drying. Now what, what I'd seen on the ground and heard repeatedly is there was an enormous amount of training going on in the 2000s, in the early 2000s of male cocoa farmers because men were deemed to be the only cocoa farmers. And I kept hearing men aren't listening. And I had this image of all these cocoa farmers going to training programs 
with their you know, ears, fingers in their ears. Of course, the reality is that it was women that were doing the work and the message wasn't getting through to the women, with some exceptions, such as Quapacoco. Um, so therefore, if you want to address issues around yields and quality, you have to address gender issues. And so a number of different initiatives have, have evolved over time, and, and I'll come back to those in a second. Um, about two years ago, um, having done work with um, Cadbury uh, Cocoa Partnership, of course that was then bought by Mondelez and became Cocoa Life, I went back and looked at their initiative, which had a very strong gender focus from the beginning, partly because those who were involved in developing the initiative themselves also had a strong gender interest. And I looked at, uh, it was a very small case study, two communities, uh, one in the uh, western region, one in the eastern region, and looked at how, what were the gender implications of their program. And what I found was that in both communities in early stages, there was a lot of resistance to the, to the idea that you should be empowering women, supporting women, training women, um, uh, giving financial support to women um, uh, in, in cocoa farming, whether they owned land or not. And that was a key component um, of the cocoa, Cadbury Cocoa Partnership, which became Cocoa Life. Um, what I then found was that in one community, there was a lot of resistance and that that resistance con continued from male farmers who felt very challenged by women becoming good cocoa farmers. In the other community, there had been some initial resistance, but as there was a realization that if you increased product, uh, if you increased the, the, the sort of the cocoa farming itself improved, you could increase yields, you could increase incomes, male cocoa farmers were much more supportive and, and engaged in promoting gender equality. And you were seeing the beginning of land gifting of land from male farmers to women involved in production. So you were beginning to see sort of substantive changes, just the beginnings of. And this is just two photographs uh, from one of the communities. Um, and this is a woman cocoa farmer who ha was involved in the program and had support. Um, and I spent time with her and visited her farm. And she's on the farm, and you can see it's very clear, uh, the, um, clean, cleared, the land is properly cleared, um, etc. Right next door to that farm was another cocoa farm uh, owned by a male cocoa farmer, not in the program, I should say. So we're not comparing men and women in the program. I'm not quite sure if you can spot the cocoa trees, but somewhere amongst the weeds and etc., there is cocoa, I promise you. And that was pure coincidence. They were showing me, look at, look at that farm. So you can see the difference that it makes. Now, despite that, she faced serious problems. She was definitely improving her yields. Uh, it was mu uh, her, her life for her as a cocoa farmer was much better because of the support, but her input costs were going up, both the input of fertilizers um, and um, pesticide uh, uh, products, and also labor costs. So her net, in although her gross income was increasing, her net income was not increasing necessarily. So therefore, despite all the improvements and the empowerment, there are still significant challenges. So just to, uh, sorry, and I should just say, because I did work in a number of countries for Cadbury, this is a very quick one. Um, in India, where they're expanding cocoa production because of the increased demand for cocoa in Asia, I was taken to a Cadbury model farm and introduced to the model farmer. And then that's just uh, not deliberate, that was just she was the best farmer, so she was therefore used as a model farm. So just to finalize, there are a whole range of initiatives now, and it's fantastic to see who are involved in, um, or, or who are, are integrating gender into their programs, including the World Cocoa Foundation's Cocoa Action Plan, but many companies as well. But I think the longest, and, and this is why it's so great to be here, that the longest practicing um, initiative that's really integrated gender has been Quapacoco. Divine is, for me, the kind of 
the UK and the, pub, the ex international uh, manifestation of that in terms of chocolate. And it's just so great to see this logo coming up on chocolate bars, really telling the others what it's all about and, and how gender should be integrated into the cocoa chocolate value chain. So I'll leave it there.